We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody. Can you hear us? Seems to be the case. Uh, my name is Thomas Schneider. I work for the Swiss government, and I'm happy to uh, and honored to be the moderator of this uh, parliamentarian uh, roundtable, which is uh, something that we had already physically two years ago in Berlin, um, where I was also moderating, and I'm happy to do this again. And this time, of course, under the condition or the circumstances that we have a number of colleagues connected uh, via remote, and we have a number of, of colleagues here, so we're hoping that this will work out nicely, and we trust, of course, um, the technicians that do a great job and our Polish host and the UN team so that this all works out. Um, we only have an hour, so uh, I'll immediately go into, into uh, uh, presenting uh, our first speaker um, that we have. Um, which is, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. and I hope I'm pronouncing um, it correctly, Mr. Richard Terlecki. He's the Vice Marshal of the Sejm of Poland. Thank you very much. Nasza debata jest kontynuacją, jak i też rozwinięciem dotychczasowej debaty parlamentarnej w ramach Szczytu Cyfrowego ONZ. Od trzech lat z powodzeniem wspólnie realizujemy założenia Okrągłego Stołu Parlamentarzystów rozpoczętego w 2019 roku. Tegoroczna debata będzie dotyczyła rozwiązań legislacyjnych w promowaniu cyfrowej przestrzeni zorientowanej na użytkownika. Musimy pamiętać, że nowe technologie przynoszą nie tylko korzyści. Wiele z nich może być również źródłem istotnych zagrożeń, takich jak cyberprzestępczość, dezinformacja, manipulacja. Umiejętność weryfikacji faktów i krytycznego myślenia jest podstawą rozpoznawania fałszywych informacji i ma znaczenie dla odporności społeczeństwa na plagę fake newsów. Szanowni Państwo, władze publiczne każdego państwa powinny zmierzać do zwalczania fałszywej narracji. Unia Europejska i państwa członkowskie są częstym celem kampanii dezinformacyjnych, które mają osłabić jej działania i wartości. Przykładem takich działań jest dezinformacja szerzona przez reżim białoruski oraz władze Federacji Rosyjskiej wobec Polski, ale także innych państw regionu w sytuacji kryzysu migracyjnego na granicach z Białorusią. W sierpniu 2020 roku Aleksander Łukaszenka dzięki fałszerstwom oraz zastraszaniu, prześladowaniu kandydatów opozycji zwyciężył w wyborach prezydenckich. Po tych wyborach sytuacja w zakresie praw człowieka, swobód obywatelskich i instytucji demokratycznych uległa pogorszeniu. Przywódcy opozycji byli albo aresztowani, albo zmuszani do emigracji, co wywołało ogromne protesty na Białorusi. Unia Europejska nałożyła sankcje na władze białoruskie odpowiedzialne za masową rozprawę z opozycją i dziennikarzami. Próbując zwrócić uwagę, przepraszam, odwrócić uwagę od łamania praw człowieka oraz aby zdestabilizować sąsiednie kraje i zewnętrzną granicę Unii Europejskiej, reżim białoruski zaczął celowo sprowadzać imigrantów przede wszystkim z państw Bliskiego Wschodu. Należy podkreślić, że są to migranci zarobkowi, zachęceni przez reżim białoruski obietnicą przedostania się do Unii Europejskiej za wysoką opłatą. Tymczasem media rosyjskie i białoruskie otwarcie obwiniają Polskę o wywołanie kryzysu na granicy i regularnie manipulują informacjami na temat sytuacji migrantów. Montowane są ujęcia z rzekomymi skargami migrantów na działania polskich służb granicznych. Tworzone są fałszywe konta, by podszywać się pod dziennikarzy. Publikowane są posty fikcyjnych osób w różnych językach. Takim formom agresji musimy stanowczo przeciwdziałać. 
To parlamenty mają dużą rolę w zapewnieniu, aby internet pozostał otwarty, a jednocześnie bezpieczny dla swoich użytkowników. Właściwe regulacje prawne powinny wspierać rozwój społeczny w erze nowych technologii. Szanowni Państwo, cieszę się, że nasza współpraca w ramach debaty parlamentarnej stale się rozwija. Mam nadzieję, że kolejne kraje, kraje gospodarze, Etiopia, Japonia, których przedstawicieli gościmy dzisiaj wśród nas, będą kontynuować ten proces. W tym miejscu pragnę również serdecznie podziękować Organizacji Narodów Zjednoczonych, Unii Międzyparlamentarnej oraz Departamentowi Polityki Cyfrowej, Kancelarii Prezesa Rady Ministrów za pomoc i współpracę z Polskim Sejmem przy organizacji tegorocznej debaty parlamentarnej na szczycie cyfrowym ONZ. Dziękuję za uwagę. Życzę udanych obrad. Thank you very much, Mr. Telecki. Next, I have Liu Zhenmin, Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for moderating this uh, uh, IGF Parliamentary Roundtable. Uh, you mentioned, I think, uh, uh, this is the second time, a second session for the IGF to convene a parliamentary segment. So I, I want to use this opportunity to thank uh, all the parliamentaries uh, and all the parliaments around the world for their support and active engagement in this roundtable. Uh, so I want to also want to thank the Interparliamentary Union for its support to the IGF. Your honorable parliamentarians, I think the single colleagues, uh, uh, parliaments are the places where legislation is developed, including those for the internet and the digital space. Indeed, parliamentarians are among the key actors in internet governance and digital policy debates. So I'm pleased that the IGF is one place where parliamentarians can exchange information and good practices among themselves, and where they can interact with other stakeholders on pressing issues related to the use, evolution, and the governance of the internet and digital technologies. Dear colleagues, the theme for this one table Legislative approaches for user-centric dis digital space is very well chosen. When decisions are made on how to develop, make available, and regulate digital technologies, understanding how technology works and what users need is essential. We need technologies to be human-centric, to enable the exercise of human rights and to make people's lives easier. Dear colleagues, we have seen in recent years an increasing trend of legislation being put forward in national and regional parla parliaments covering issues such as privacy, cybersecurity, data protection, content policy, competition, and consumer protection. I think this is a very good trend. That's why we want to have this IGF parliamentary roundtable to discuss how we could improve the international cooperation among the parliaments. I believe it is important to have rules and regulations in place that aim to tackle risks associated with the digital space govern the behavior of market actors and protect rights and freedoms. I also believe it is important to ensure that these rules are indeed oriented towards global, uh, to, to, towards the goal of having a user-centric digital space. This is important while balancing the various rights at risk at, at stake and providing a predictable environment for the private sector to operate. I hope that the IGF 2021 parliamentary track will inspire this by exchanging 
good practices and deepening cooperation among parliamentarians on digital policy issues. I trust such cooperation will continue in the years to come. And that the parliamentary track will be one of the annual hallmarks of the IGF session. So we are going to convene next year again, the parliamentary track. Uh, dear colleagues, before closing, I wish to thank the Intel Parliamentary Union, especially the, the president of the Parliamentary Union. He, he's going to join us to speak online. And the lower chamber in the Polish parliament, the same, uh, SEJM, for partnering with the UN DESA and my department in hosting this parliamentary track. I also want to thank uh, Thomas for you for moderating this e event. I wish all of you a fruitful exchange, and I look forward to receiving the outcomes of 2021 parliamentary track. I thank you. Thank you, you, and actually thank you also for already introducing our next uh, speaker, which will be the last of the first three entry speakers. Um, it's uh, Duarte Pacheco, I hope I pronounced it right, from the Interparliamentary Unit, the president of the IPU. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Deputy Marshal of the Senate, Mr. Undersecretary General of the United Nations, dear parliamentarians and dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to be with you. Of course, it is uh, conflicting feelings that I, I will welcome you on behalf of IPU to this Parliamentarian Roundtable. On uh, one hand, I really wish to be with you in Katowice until the last wave of this COVID-19 pandemic prevented me from traveling because nothing can ever, ever replace the face-to-face -face interaction and conversations that are so important to us, human beings, and as parliamentarians. On the other hand, I can only marvel at the digital infrastructure that enable us to connect from all around the world and to be together at this moment. And also, this uh, technology helps us to, have, to keep our working as parliamentarians during the pandemic times. It is just one more illustration of how, uh, how central digital techno technology has become to everything that we do. As parliamentarians, the internet can sometimes seem difficult to apprehend. In, it is in one way highly techni technical and yet it is also part of everyday life for the people we represent. It is transnational by design, a perfect example of the benefits of interconnection and integration around a set of agreed technical standards. But this transnational nature of the internet is a comfortable. As politicians, we are used, so used to thinking and acting in our national contexts. When addressing challenge and creating opportunities online, we cannot act alone. We must act together. Just like last week, the IPU adopted a new resolution on the combat against online child sexual exploitation and abuse. That resolution underlines that gaps and differences in legislation from one country to another allows for loopholes that others will be quick to exploit. Harmonized legislation and the high level of international cooperation are absolutely essential Yet, we are only beginning to take steps in this direction. Even the issues that can appear technical have a strong political dimension. It is our goal to continue to work together to guarantee the openness of the internet, to ensure freedom of expression, and to promote economic opportunities 
while combating criminal, criminal, criminality and disinformation. And allow me to talk, the hate speech that can also spread online. Underlying, all of this is a fundamental consideration. Who sets the rules? And what should those rules be? In this area, it is every other political leadership is key. As the elected representatives of the people, we have a special role on this matter. Decisions need to be informed by the best possible advice from all the actors, grounded in the evidence and taking into the best interests of the community in mind. I welcome very much the desire to create a greater space for dialogue with parliamentarians at the EGF. The EGF is the available platform for multi-stakeholder multi dialogue with governments, civil society and the private sector. We must continue to learn how to speak to each other, to understand each other, to respect each other and make every effort to reach the best possible conclusions. I hope this EGF will help to reinforce cooperation at all levels around the vision for a user-centered digital space, of which we can all be proud, as one of the great inventions of humanity. I wish you all a very productive work, and I will wait the conclusions that you will achieve. And please, keep safe. I hope to meet you in person very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Duarte Pacheco, president of the IPU. And just to pick up one word, or two words actually, that uh, Liu Semin said, mentioned this, that digital transformation should be human-centric. And given that worldwide, uh, it is the parliamentarians that are representing uh, humans in, in, uh, in, in the countries on national level, on, on local level. So I think it makes even more sense to have parliamentarians as a core part of the IGF. And this is just one of the sessions uh, of the so-called parliamentarian track. There are others uh, during the week. So, of course, um, we are looking forward to, to uh, allowing uh, 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 an exciting interaction among parliamentarians, but also between parliamentarians and other stakeholders, ordinary citizens, representatives of business, civil society, uh, governments, and, and so on. And uh, there is also, for your information, in case you do not know, there's a, uh, they are working on, a, on an outcome document out of the track, so there's a, there's a draft that they are, uh, will be finalizing and then issuing at the end of this track. So in case you were not aware of this, this is also going to be an interesting document. With this, let me now turn to the parliamentarian themselves. Uh, some of them are here physically, others are connected remotely. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Abdullah Al-Tawadi, member of Council of Representatives of the Kingdom of Bahrain. The floor is yours. A very good, good evening to you all. Mr. Al-Khair, Yes'udini al-Musharaka abr al-internet. Al-Technology al-Rahmiya tatasara bishakil kabir jiddan. ونحن نعيش وقت مميز جدا لم نكن من قبل متصلين بالعالم مثل اتصالنا اليوم بإمكاننا مشاركة الآخرين أفكارنا اقتراحاتنا ومشاعرنا ولكن البعض أبدى قلقه الشديد أيضا بسبب تزايد الجرائم السيبرانية وانتهاك الخصوصية والتي تعتبر حقا أصيلا من حقوق الإنسانية والقانونية في الحفاظ عليها شهدت تكنولوجيا خلال الأعوام الأخيرة تطورات غير مسبوقة حيث باتت أنظمة الحاسبات قادرة على محاكاة وأداء المهام التي تتطلب عادة الذكاء البشري في القيام بها مثل الإدراك البصري والتعرف على الوجه والكلام بل وصنع القرار أيضا 
إذ يتم تزويد الحسابات بالقدرة على الإدراك والتخطيط والتواصل وأخيرا التنفيذ الأمر الذي مكننا من اختراق كافة مجالات الحياة بداية من المجالات التكنولوجية والتجارية وصولا إلى المجالات السياسية والعسكرية بل والعديد من المجالات الاجتماعية ذات الأهمية مثل الرعاية الصحية والتعليم والعمالة والعدالة الجنائية وغيرها فتتيح التكنولوجيا الرقمية وسائل جديدة لممارسة حقوق الإنسان ولكنها تستخدم في حالات كثيرة جدا لانتهاك حقوق الإنسان وينبقي وضع حقوق الإنسان في صميم الأطر التنظيمية المتعلقة بتطوير التكنولوجيات الرقمية واستخداماتها وتثير مسائل حماية البيانات والهوية الرقمية واستخدام التكنولوجيا المراقبة والتحرش باستخدام الانترنت وإدارة محتويات شواغل خاصة في هذا الصدى نحن في مملكة البحرين قد قمنا بتشريعات قدمنا تشريعات في مملكة ذات علاقة بالحقوق الرقمية والجرائم المعلوماتية في قطاع تكنولوجيا المعلومات والاتصالات كانت مملكة البحرين سباقة في هذه الأمور وقد تم وقد تم اصدار قانون بشان تقنيه المعلومات وجرائم السيبرانيه وكذلك قوانين الخطابات والمعلومات الالكترونيه وايضا قانون المهم وهو قانون حمايه البيانات الشخصيه وايضا الحوسبه قوانين الحوسبه السحابيه وبذلك نكون قد قمنا بالتصديق على الاتفاقيات العربية بخصوص الجرائم الإلكترونية وهذا يعطي البحرين التقدم في الحماية بذلك ولكن بالرغم من الجهود التي تقوم بها الدول للحماية ومكافحة الجريمة السيبرانية فالدول تحتاج إلى مزيد من الجهود الوطنية لسن وتحديث القوانين الخاصة بالفضاء السيبراني وتوفير الهيكلة التنظيمية والحوكمة الإدارية لتنفيذها كما أن هناك حاجة لتنسيق التشريعات السيبرانية والحماية بين دول العالم وهذه مهمة البرلمانات الدولية منها الاي بي يو شكرا جزيلا Thank you. It is exciting to hear what is going on in Bahrain. And now let's see uh, what is going on in, in a European country or in the European Parliament. Let me turn to Marina Calderand, member of the European Parliament. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you for the kind introduction. And yes, I'm representing here the European Parliament and I'm elected from Estonia. So I'm really privileged. I come from a country which is very e-connected, we call it e-lifestyle, and I come from a region where digital topics are high on political agenda. To start with, I would also like to thank Under Secretary General and the IPO for having this uh, parliamentary track, for supporting it. It's now the third time, second time we meet face to face, we meet some old friends, there are many new friends in the hall, and I think that finally, it's finally established. It's part of IGF, so I'm really looking forward to our closer discussions. <coughs> and my third introductory remark, yes, I'm honored and happy to bring some gender balance to the discussion, but I'm not happy to see that I'm the only one, and unfortunately, when politics and di digital come together, we still need more women speaking. So that's so that suggestion for the next year. But coming to the topic, we all use the right political words. We all speak about open, free, accessible, affordable, undivided, one internet. But then we look around and we see that the legal systems are different. Laws adopted in different countries are different. So we as politicians and members of the parliament, I would argue, should first of all take into account the international law, international principles, international core values, and build our laws on that. 
That will help us from dividing internet, from balkanization of internet, from different internets and different systems. That's not easy, but that's doable. I know that from my former, former lives in the UNGG and in the uh, Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, it's doable with different, multi with different stakeholders. Second, I think that we as politicians should also sometimes take leadership. Yes, we are talking to our people. I'm talking to my citizens on a daily basis. They're sending me emails. We are, we are, we are exchanging uh, video calls. We're doing it constantly. But we can't follow them all the time. Sometimes we have to lead the process. And I'll bring you an example. In the EU at the moment, we are arguing about digital ID. My country did it 20 years ago. Kenya did it last year. In the EU, we can't agree. So I would, uh, I would also ask all politicians sometimes to reconsider the small benefits and to see the bigger picture and to lead some topics that might not be very popular at the beginning, but that are good and we have to explain and talk more about them. We as politicians, we have a special responsibility for the protection of privacy, fundamental rights and human rights. Yes, we all say human rights offline are equal to human rights offline. But are they really? I think there is a lot we can do much better in protecting our own citizens, our constituencies, our electorate. And that's without buts. Next. When we talk about digital topics, members of the parliament very often have to leave their comfort zone because that's something that seems so difficult, so complicated. We need much more awareness raising, we need much more education. If you want clever laws, you need clever lawmakers. And that's why maybe we should also encourage more our, our, our other members of parliament in the European Parliament, as well as national parliaments, to come to meetings like this one, to talk to other stakeholders, to talk to other members of the parliaments and to see that we all have questions, that we all are learning from each other, we are all exchanging our best practices and best information. My second point. Fortunately, we have seen that the digital topics have moved from the basements, where they were discussed by the IT geeks, to the CEO levels. We also see that governments are putting more uh, priorities in more digital topics, especially also because of the COVID pandemic. But the digital topics have also moved to the parliamentary halls. We do not see enough digital discussions within parliaments, and we have to do that. Exchange of information. Today we had the first meeting of our parliamentary track, and what struck me was that we in Europe, we're lucky. And maybe we do not always understand what does it mean, inclusiveness? What does it mean that half a world's population is still not online? And it's not the question of political will, but in many cases, it's the question of capacity building. So yes, we rich countries have to be much more open to capacity building, to assisting, to development cooperation. And I'm proud that my country, which is, I don't know, one street in Cairo, is doing development cooperation projects with other countries, developing countries of the world. And my final remarks. I was thinking what we as members of the parliament can do nationally, regionally, universally, because I think that we can do it together. Nationally, I think that one of the first steps can be introducing support groups, interest groups. I think all parliaments have them, if not committees, commissions, then at least support groups. We have them in the European Parliament. Trust me, they are horizontal, they work very well, although we have different political views. Regional cooperation, crucial, because regionally we come more together and we, can, we meet more each other, we can exchange information. For me, it's EU and NATO. For other regions, other regions. And on global level, I would urge us all to consider very seriously the proposal of Secretary General on Global Digital Compact. That should be one of the next steps of our cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And in particular, I, I, um, I think we should take note of the gender and other balances that we still have to improve. Um,
just one word about the EID, because this is uh, something that in my country, Switzerland, we also had a proposal and everybody or most of the people were convinced that we need it. But there was a referendum and the people turned it down because they didn't trust the governance model. They thought it was too much based on private sector and the state should have a more active role. Just to say that legislation is fine, but you need to be connected to the people. If you legislate against what the people expect you to legislate, even simple things as an EID may not be acceptable. With this, I guess that will be part of the discussion later. With this, let me, let me go to our next speaker. Uh, it is Mr. Alexander Kinstein, Chairman of the Committee on Information Policy, Information Technology and Communications from the State Duma Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Так. К сожалению, почему-то не включается видео. Так, прошу прощения, коллеги, но почему-то организатор пишет, что его включение видео остановлено. So we can hear you, but apparently there's a problem with the video. Уважаемые коллеги, ну, для того, чтобы не ставить всех участников в неудобное положение, с вашего позволения я начну тогда выступление. Надеюсь, что все-таки коллеги из технической службы сумеют разблокировать возможность включения видеосигнала. Может быть, не загрузится? Коллеги, тогда, если позволите, 5 секунд, я перезагружусь, это к вопросу о качестве работы нашего интернета совместного, и зайду, пытаюсь зайти снова. Так, сейчас, одну секунду. Or should we allow... Uh... Mr. Kinstein, maybe to, to and, and the technicians to solve the problem and, and take another member of the parliament first. Question to the directors in the back, if they can. <laughs> if this was a movie, I would or a TV show, I would ask the directors in the back. So, maybe. Ah, now it's. We seem to have a, an image. So, okay. То, что, за то, что подождали наши технические сложности. Уважаемые коллеги, во-первых, я рад приветствовать всех на таком представительном, очень важном форуме и рад возможности выступить для краткого рассказа о тех изменениях, которые происходят сегодня в Российской Федерации, в первую очередь законодательного характера. Надо сказать, что интернет... В России начался в свое время как эксперимент энтузиастов в нескольких научных центров, математическом отделении Академии наук и Курчатском институте. Конечно, никто не мог представить тогда, что за столь короткий по историческим масштабам срок интернет превратится в силу, радикально меняющую нашу жизнь, а управление интернетом станет предметом межгосударственных отношений. В Российской Федерации мы отлично понимаем важность и значимость цифровизации. В всех органах власти существуют профильные управления, подразделения, курирующие цифру. Есть самостоятельное Министерство цифрового развития, ну и, наконец, президентом страны Владимиром Путиным определена в качестве национальной идеи развития до 2030 года цифровая трансформация. С учетом этого меняется и национальное законодательство, 
создаются условия для развития IT-кадров и цифровых отраслей. В нашей стране всегда были собственные, очень сильные и профессиональные технологические IT-компании. Россия – одно из тех государств мира, кто имеет свои собственные поисковые сервисы, картографию, антивирусы, развита национальная интернет-торговля, очень сильное программное обеспечение, софт, ну, наконец, наши национальные социальные сети имеют больше локальных пользователей, нежели чем иностранных. Российская доменная зона демонстрирует устойчивый рост, и на сегодняшний день более 5 миллионов доменов находятся в зоне .ru, а русский язык входит в тройку самых популярных языков в интернете. Очень важно, что все эти достижения достигнуты в условиях открытого рынка и свободной конкуренции, которую мы должны сохранить. Наши IT-специалисты конкурентоспособны на глобальном уровне и могли бы добиваться успеха, и добиваются его в разных частях мира. Мы это отлично понимаем и будем и впредь создавать условия для развития отрасли и самореализации наших специалистов на родине в России. Сегодня в Российской Федерации для стимулирования развития цифровых отраслей реализуется целый ряд мер. Я позволю перечислить некоторые из них. Во-первых, введен беспрецедентный налоговый режим. Для тех российских компаний, кто занимается разработкой и реализацией софта программного обеспечения, четыре раза снижены страховые взносы на фонд оплаты труда по сравнению с другими компаниями. Ставка налога на прибыль снижена с 20% до 3%. Сохранена нулевая ставка НДС, налога на добавленную стоимость, для тех продуктов, которые включены в реестр отечественного программного обеспечения. Действующий с начала текущего года льготный налоговый режим создал очень мощную динамику развития отрасли, что подтверждается объективными цифрами, данными налоговой службы. Важно сказать, коллеги, что российский рынок был, есть и, уверен, останется открытым для иностранных компаний. Заверяю вас, что у России нет и не может быть каких-либо планов по закрытию своего внешнего контура, по созданию абсолютно отрезанной от внешнего мира интернет-систем. Но мы при горячем и искреннем желании видеть на своей юрисдикции иностранных участников рынка, в то же время выдвигая, на наш взгляд, вполне обоснованное условие – неукоснительное соблюдение российского национального законодательства. Недопустимой ситуации, когда компания имеет, скажем, конкурентные преимущества перед российскими компаниями, потому что не соблюдает установленных законом требований, не несет нагрузки по соблюдению правил, но, повторюсь, нет никакой разницы для российского закона иностранные или отечественные IT-ресурс, IT-компании. Требования соблюдения российских законов одинаковы для всех. Уплата налогов, хранение персональных данных наших граждан на территории России, взаимодействие с регулятором. Мы очень рассчитываем на то, что выстраивание открытого диалога с иностранными IT-гигантами, с так называемым «бигтехом», будет способствовать появление их официальных представительств на территории нашей страны. Я напомню, что такое требование содержится в принятом Государственной Думе, Думе и подписанном президентом законом, который мы назвали о приземлении. К 1 января 2022 года иностранные гиганты IT-индустрии, чья суточная аудитория в Российской Федерации составляет от полумиллиона пользователей на протяжении не менее полугода, должны будут выполнить три простых правила. Первое. Создать на территории России полноценный филиал или представительство. При этом это представительство может быть и цифровым. Второе. Зарегистрировать на сайте нашего регулятора Роскомнадзора личный кабинет. И третье. Создать на своем ресурсе ящик для обратной связи с российскими пользователями. Как видите, коллеги, все эти правила не сложны в реализации вполне объясним. Появление и таких представительств на территории России позволит вести прямой и конструктивный диалог, который сегодня, увы, очень часто у нас 
сбоит ну, по причине отсутствия здесь каких-либо уполномоченных представителей, с которыми государство могло бы вести диалог. Важнейшей задачей этой законодательной инициативы является обеспечение цифровых прав граждан нашей страны, особенно в части защиты их персональных данных и предоставления возможности отстаивать свои интересы в российском правовом поле. Очевидно, что гражданам гораздо сложнее во всех смыслах защищать свои права в иностранных юрисдикциях. Мы видим сегодня уже успешные примеры того, как IT-гиганты открывают свои представительства на территории России и при этом говорят, что это не только не вызывает у них никаких сложностей, а напротив способствует развитию и расширению бизнеса, увеличению их прибыли. В частности, еще до вступления нашего закона в силу такие представительства были открыты AliExpress, iHerb, Huawei Technology. Мы очень надеемся на то, что компании, которые по своим критериям подпадают под требования о приземлении, также выполнят требования закона и продолжат тот ряд, который я уже перечислил. При этом хочу отметить, что российские меры по регулированию интернет-пространства всегда были сбалансированы. В отношении нарушающих законодательства IT-гигантов потенциальные возможные наказания – носит умеренно жесткий характер, а регулятор постоянно идет на диалог и готов делать послабления для тех, кто настроен на конструктивный разговор. Ну, в частности, как я уже сказал, норма закона обязывает впрямую иностранные гигантские ресурсы с аудиторией от полумиллиона человек в сутки уже к 1 января следующего нового года зарегистрировать свои представительства. Однако наш регулятор Роскомнадзор заявил, что не будет применять административные санкции строго именно с 1 января. Но при этом мы, конечно же, рассчитываем, что в течение первого месяца нового года Бигтех соответствующее положение закона выполнит. Россия одна из стран, задающих тренды в регулировании интернета и защиты правовых прав пользователей. Представители Российской Федерации могут поделиться uh, с for, коллегами. Uh, excuse, basically have announced for people to speak for three minutes. So it would be good if you could uh, come, come to the conclusion, otherwise uh, we will run out of time before uh, all parliamentarians have spoken. Thank you very much. Хорошо, я постараюсь тогда близко к завершению. И хочу сказать о том, что, коллеги, пандемия, коронавирусная инфекция, конечно, оказала при всех своих негативных явлениях позитивное влияние на развитие цифровых отраслей на территории нашей страны. Сегодня на повестке дня в России очень остро стоят проблемы, связанные с обеспечением кибербезопасности, с предотвращением преступлений в цифровой среде. Увы, мы видим сегодня высокий рост подобного рода преступлений, поэтому законодательно пытаемся этому помешать. Принят целый ряд инициатив, направленных на защиту прав наших граждан, на борьбу с киберпреступностью. Ну и отдельно хочу сказать также о том, что для России, как для самого большого по площади территории государства на планете, огромное значение имеет вопрос обеспечения приемом устойчивого интернета и связи всех территорий нашей страны. Эта работа сегодня также активно ведется во всех населенных пунктах России с численностью от 100 жителей по закону, принятому в текущем году должен быть обеспечен устойчивый прием интернета. Уважаемые друзья, Россия всегда была открыта и будет открыта Thank международному you. сотрудничеству для создания безопасной цифровой среды. В этой связи диалог, который ведется в IGF, сегодня представляет огромную ценность для выработки актуальных и взвешенных решений в сфере регулирования интернета. Рассчитываю на то, что межгосударственный обмен опытом принятия законодательства um, so основным драйвером развития. Thank you. Next is uh, Alhage Bo, from a member of parliament from Gambia. Please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon to everybody. And uh, it's good to see you again on this IGF. Um, uh, I want to say also um, um, good afternoon to my fellow parliamentarians, um, uh, those that are watching and those are, that are here with me. Now. 
um, when we, we are glad, or I'm also glad, that now we have a parliamentary track that actually ensures that we have parliamentarians um, who are the servants of the people um, uh, to also ensure that they understand what they are legislating. Because the fast pace of technology, in terms of the way it is moving, um, also calls for parliamentarians to also understand um, what they are actually legislating. And I think this is a forum um, that we should encourage all other parliamentarians across the world to be able to attend, to be able to share ideas with their colleagues, just to ensure that when we go to legislate, we know exactly what we're going to do to ensure that we help our people in ensuring that they are part of this digital world. Now, as the world moves faster in terms of connectivity, in terms of really bridging that gap between sovereignty nations, I think it's essentially important that we have laws that would protect our people. And I think it's also equally important that we encourage our members of parliament to be deeply engaged in the digital world. Um, because I'm also a member of the, of the African parliament, in the, that's the Pan-African parliament in South Africa. But you also see that we have very few parliamentarians actually that are engaged in the, in the technology. So I think it's quite important that in our respective countries, we try to encourage and we also try to bring them on board just to ensure that we have um, uh, wonderful legislations. Now, if you look at the African continent, um, uh, especially at the level of the AU, um, uh, we are developing laws or we are de developing some conventions like the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. Now, where we are coming with this is to ensure that countries actually take a copy of those areas and then design or, design or legislate laws because right now, when you look at the continent itself, um, uh, even though we are, we are moving, um, uh, to, to, we are really playing a catch-up game in terms of technology. And in doing so, we must act fast, just to ensure that um, uh, we have the requisite legislations in place. Now, personal data protection is equally important, because when you look at the, the medical area, you look at the financial industry, it's equally important that data has been collected from our, our, our citizens, but no one tells you really what they do with the data. So I think it's important that the African Union um, uh, Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection is actually adopted across the continent just to ensure that we really protect our citizens in the continent and also outside the continent. And just to ensure that we live in a world um, uh, that is really uh, well protected. Now, if you go to the other area in terms of data protection also as well, you have data being stored across the continent. We have data that being stored outside the continent, but countries really have no legislation to ensure that you know, um, some level of security actually are done. Like when you go to Facebook, um, uh, you go to your banks, for example, some of them, they store their data outside, outside the continent or outside your country. But if you checked, most of the countries also, they do not have legislation to ensure that their citizens' data actually are well protected. So I'm um, encouraging all legislators, especially those from our continent, to ensure that they do more in terms of protecting their citizens um, data to ensure that um, uh, whenever we have um, uh, legislations, they really do public hearings to ensure that those that actually well us in the area of technology actually are contacted. Those that are well us in technology also have a say to ensure that we have a very good legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, the notion that parliamentarians are not necessarily uh, experienced with digital is not an African phenomenon. It's uh, also taking place in my country. Although, and I hope this is uh, the case for many countries, the pandemic, one of the good effects is that it has helped people, including parliamentarians, that uh, digital is an important issue and, and they are waking up, uh, probably not only in, in my country, hopefully in others as well. Um, the last uh, parliamentarian for the first round um, is uh, Gabriel Silva, member of the National Assembly of Panama. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you some ideas on the future of the internet. Uh, I was tasked to talk about a very difficult question for parliamentarians, and that's the question of how to enact and create regulation that protects the citizen, but at the same time doesn't stop innovation. And it's a very difficult question, but uh, I would like to share some remarks in regards to that. And the first thing I would say is that uh, we have to realize that policymakers can break or make the internet's present and future. And I think policymakers shouldn't break the internet. 
I think that the internet has provided so many benefits for humanity, society, countries, civilization. Just think about the COVID-19 pandemic. Imagine how life would have been, the pandemic would have been without internet. I think one of the superstars or superheroes of the pandemic was the internet and especially the entrepreneurs. Many entrepreneurs helped us uh, uh, talk digitally, work, study, uh, communicate. So I think that the internet definitely is an ally for policymakers, not an enemy. However, uh, the internet has a lot of power and a lot of companies that work in the internet sphere have a lot of power. And uh, probably if you heard this quote before, but uh, with great power comes great responsibilities. And the internet, unfortunately, is not this wonderful place where everything is, is happy. There are bad things happening in the internet and as policymakers, we should intervene. Whether it be theft, IP infringements, monopolistic practices, child pornography, bullying. There's so many things that us as parliamentarians have to do to protect our citizens. So I think uh, in order to, to find that balance in regards to protecting the citizens and at the same time don't stop innovation or don't break the internet, some couple of remarks I would like to share is that first, we're enacting legislation we should consider as our basis, as our platform, uh, as our skeleton, human rights. And uh, we should uh, modernize our human rights in our local context so that it, it, uh, it, um, it concedes, it, it applies to the digital, digital economy in the, uh, the 21st century, but also we should provide more resources to our local infrastructure, and local personnel, and local capacities to be able to defend those human rights, to be able to go to courts, to be able to follow up on what's happening in the internet. So we must provide governments with more capabilities to be able to defend uh, people in the 21st century. Second, even though human rights are a priority, we should also consider when legislating the fundamental priorities or principles of the internet. And there are a bunch of different principles that we might find online. online. I think, for example, that it has to be decentralized, doesn't have a government, open infrastructure, so that innovation doesn't require permission, uh, no restricted access, so everybody could have access to the internet, global connectivity. And there's a list online that we can find different uh, properties of the internet that are, that are natural for the internet. I, I even know that the IGF in past uh, discussions have elabor elaborated on a very interesting and powerful document that's called the Charter of uh, Human Rights and uh, the Internet, which can, I think, work as a, as a very important guiding tool. The challenging question then is when what happens when you have a conflict between a human right and one of those basic principles of the internet? And I think that us as, as parliamentaries uh, have to do then a proportionality test, a proportionality and balancing test to see, well, what human rights are being infringed and if this new policy or issue can provide important setbacks to the internet or can actually be good for the internet. Just to finalize a couple of, of additional remarks, when members of parliament do this type of pondering and proportionality analysis, I think it's key that we seek advice, we seek help, we work together with the different sectors of society, academia, startups, big tech companies to be able to create those policies. Uh, as I mentioned before in the other, uh, in the other session, um, the internet is, is changing every day, and members of parliament don't only look at the internet. We have to deal with education, with infrastructure, and with health. It's very difficult for us to be updated on the latest trends, and that's why we need you. We need the technical people. We need the academia. We need the startups to help us and guide us and work together to consensus on regulating the internet. Second is that I think that uh, a many members of parliament, and I include myself in this, are very proactive, and we like to legislate a, a lot for the future. But sometimes I think it's better that to not be so aggressive and let's see how technology can evolve. Of course, there are things that are no-brainers and we have to protect our citizens. But on some, some technologies, for example, Web3 technologies, blockchain technologies that are creating and giving back power back to the people, maybe it's more important than establishing specific regulations to establish uh, principles, guiding principles. And we can come up with those principles with obviously with the academia, nonprofit organizations, private sectors, and so forth. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, yes, the internet requires regulation. I think it should be a calm, evidence-based approach, but uh, we must find uh, the priorities in the human rights and also in the basic properties of the internet. I think that will be a very effective tool to guide us as legislators. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Actually, uh, unfortunately, time is, is almost up, but we are allowed a few minutes uh, to, to run a few minutes over. And I think this, is, this has just shown how, how difficult, how challenging it is for parliamentarians 
and and basically if if I can get just one or two uh, quick remarks on on uh, some of the issues one is how to deal with your national competencies and global developments and global facts that you cannot really change or only moderately influence. The other question, of course, would be, uh, we talk about representing people, how to make sure that, that you actually represent the people on issues that neither all parliamentarians nor all people do really fully understand. And the, f the third question is one that we are also asking ourselves in my country, given that you have a very rapid development uh, in technology, in the use of technology, and we are living on beta version, beta 0 2.0, B, blah, blah version of, of, and we have parliamentarian processes that take years, five years, ten years sometimes in my country to come up with a new law. How can we also evolve into going for a beta version law and then version 1.0, 1.0.12 1 update type of, how do we have to modify the, the political, the legislation system in order to cope with the development of technology. So uh, these are just a few, a few points thrown out in the room. I hope they will be followed up in the later sessions, but maybe a few very short remarks from one or two of you. Uh, we can afford this still, thank you. Just, just speak up, I think, also those that are connected online. I see a, a colleague from Gambia would like to say something. Just speak. I think it's the mic is on. Yeah. Just, just wait. People come. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Just continue. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think you just um, asked a very um, uh, pertinent question in terms of the representative people and the time it takes for laws to be made in some of these institutions, for example. And, and that is a fact. Now, the reason why sometimes it takes a lot of time for some of these legislation actually to, 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 you know, to be completed is because sometimes consultations need to be done. Um, now, when you could bring it in terms of technology, technology moves in a very fast way. And most of the legislators actually, you know, they are here, they can, they can, they can confirm that they are not very well off way with technology. So which means they would have to defend, depend a lot on other people to help them. And by the time, you know, some of these things actually are brought to fruition, of, to fruition you, know, you know, something else comes up. So I think that's why I was saying earlier that it's very important that parliamentarians be more engaged into technology so they can have better understanding. Now, if you check most parliaments in the world, um, if you check the number of people that actually have technology backgrounds, it actually is very limited. And that alone would actually affect some of the legislation that we actually have. Now, my own parliament in the Gambia, we only have two people that are technology oriented, myself and another person that actually I taught in the university. So forced to put some of the points across, it makes it really very difficult because they do not understand. So by the time we do public consultations, we talk to people, talk to people in academia, it really takes a lot of time. So, and that's the reason why I was saying we need to en en encourage our fellow parliamentarians to be more involved in technology or to encourage other academia that actually help us in technology to be members of parliament that will actually make that you know very fast um, in terms of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a person in the Zoom, uh, Ahmed Al Mohanadi. A, a short remark from remote. Thank you. Cannot yet hear you. You may have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, we cannot hear you speaking. Unfortunately, this does not seem to work because we don't we don't hear anything. Now I hear something. Um, maybe another quick remark from from somebody. Yes, Marina. Uh, thank you. Yes, we all know in this room that European bureaucracy is very slow. 
sorry guys to say that, but that's the, that's the thing. So sometimes maybe it's better to react on a national level, but the basic values, the basic laws, the basic principles are in place. So my advice to national parliaments, that's what we're trying to do at home, is to be smart, to be quick, to be flexible. And of course, as you all know, there are sometimes executive orders that might be taken more quickly if it's needed. And I think the COVID pandemic showed very well what can be done globally, what can be done regionally, what has to be done nationally. So uh, many people have suffered, many people have died, but we'll be really stupid if we do not learn from the COVID experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have to, to end this session, but again, this is not the end of the parliamentary track. Um, as, a, as a bureaucrat, allow me, I'm not a member of, we are not a member of the European Union, but we are still bureaucrats. On the other hand, it, it is sometimes useful if the parliament does not try to legislate on too much on technology, but the laws stay on the principal levels so that you can actually then adapt them to the, uh, to the development of technology and you do not have to recreate uh, uh, too detailed technology, unneutral laws all the time. So this is something that from the bureaucrat side uh, would be a wish to, to, to uh, uh, the, the lawmakers in, in, in the countries that the more you stay on the principal level, the easier and the faster you can actually adapt as bureaucracy with implementing the laws. So thank you for this discussion. And again, I hope this continues. Um, uh, physically here in, in Katowice, virtually, hybridly, and uh, also, of course, for the next uh, IGF that will come in 2022. Thank you all, and uh, see you soon. <laughs>